Søren Kierkegaard, Various Readings Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7 Søren Kierkegaard By David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota Editor A. M. Strudevant, February 1920 Chapters 6, pages 16 to 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Either or. Chapter 6 Kierkegaard was unique in the degree to which his enormous energy of reflection was directed back upon himself. Subsequent criticism has uncovered very few points of view for his interpretation, not already suggested either in the literature itself or in the wealth of comment which the journals afford. In the unscientific postscript, his pseudonym, Johannes Climacus, reviews the ascetic literature and assigns to each work its place in relation to his own central thesis. Some years later, after the bulk of the religious literature had appeared, Kierkegaard wrote a literary autobiography to serve for an interpretation of the whole. The latter work, however, was not published during his lifetime. Only a brief abstract of it appears in pamphlet form. It was Kierkegaard's purpose, so he tells us in the course of his self-criticism, to formulate a definition of what it means to live, and to make this formulation fruitful and suggestive for life stirring the reader to a degree of self-activity that might help him to find himself. He believed that the age suffered from an overabundance of knowledge. Life was being made increasingly unreal, since living was being confused with knowledge about life. In this situation, it would be superfluous and even harmful merely to increase the store of knowledge already existing, even if it were possible to attain a considerable improvement upon current conceptions. This would only tend to promote the disease it was intended to cure. Kierkegaard therefore resolved systematically to eschew the abstract, objective, didactic, systematic, scientific form, and to choose instead the subjective and incidental form characteristic of a knowledge completely assimilated to the personality. In other words, he presents knowledge in use as distinct from knowledge in the form of potentiality for use. To delineate different standpoints and ideals of life in this way is to present personalities, quote, existing in their thoughts, unquote, and thus revealing through self-expression the personal significance of the standpoints they occupy. As a consequence, the ascetic literature is pseudonymous and polyonymous. The different authors are Kierkegaard's creations, but, Quote, their words, their views, and even their prefaces are their own productions. Unquote. Their standpoints nowhere precisely coincide with Kierkegaard's own. Being ideal personalities only, they can express themselves quote, with a disregard for consequences in good and evil, limited only by the requirements of an ideal consistency, a freedom that no actual author speaking in his own name could appropriately claim. Unquote. The work with which the literature was launched is Either Or, A Life Fragmented, by Victor Aramita, 1843. An ethical view of life is here contrasted with a purely ascetic attitude. There are two authors, an asceticist and an ethicist. Victor Aramita is merely the editor and publisher of the material, which has fallen into his hands by accident. The asceticist is the author of the papers that constitute the first volume and is designated as A. The ethicist, B, is responsible for the second volume, consisting of letters written to A, couched in terms of friendly admonition. The title of the work suggests that the reader is confronted with a decisive alternative. He is invited to weigh and choose for himself. The style of the first volume is impassioned, and throughout the work the thoughts presented glow with the warmth of personal appropriation. The alternative presented is thus characterized both in its emotional and in its intellectual significance, and the service rendered to the reader is a Socratic one of formulating the question proposed with the greatest possible clarity and precision. 
The asceticist is purposely made the more brilliant of the two authors. His glowing fancy, his hectic eloquence, and his dialectic power are all devoted to the exploitation of quasi-Byronic despair. A group of lyrical aphorisms introduces the volume. One of these gives expression to the inner discord of a poet's life, while another has a certain symbolic character as a hint of Kierkegaard's determination to utilize the comical as a factor in his literary program. I quote them here as typical of the tense eloquence characteristic of the entire volume. What is a poet? A poet is an unhappy creature. His heart is torn by secret sufferings, but his lips are so formed that when the cries and the sighs escape them, they create a sound of beautiful music. His fate is comparable to the fate of the wretched victims of the tyrant Phalaris, who were imprisoned in a brazen bull and slowly tortured over a low fire. Their cries could not reach the tyrant's ears, so as to strike terror into his heart, for they came forth transformed as sweet music. The men crowd about the poet and say, Sing for us soon again. That means, May your heart be tormented by new sufferings, and may your lips continue to be formed as before, for the cries would only disturb our peace, but the music is lively. And the critics come upon the scene and say, Quite correct, so it ought to be. The rules of ascetics have been obeyed. To be sure, a critic resembles a poet by a hair, lacking only the sufferings in his heart and the music on his lips. And that is why I would rather be a swinherd and be understood by the swine than be a poet and be misunderstood by men. Something wonderful has happened to me. I was carried up into the seventh heaven. There all the gods were assembled together. As a mark of their especial favor, I was granted a wish. Said Mercury, Will you have youth, or beauty, or power, or a long life, or the most beautiful of maidens, or some other of the many grand things we have here in the chest? You may choose what you will, but only one thing. For a moment I was at a loss but quickly recovered myself and addressed the gods as follows. Honorable contemporaries, I choose always to have the laugh on my side. None of the gods answered me by a single word. On the contrary, they all began to laugh. This I interpreted as a sign that my wish was to be fulfilled, and I perceived that the gods knew how to express themselves with taste for it would hardly have been suitable to the occasion for them to have answered me solemnly, Your prayer is granted. End of quotations. The essays which make up the bulk of the volume deal with a variety of topics. There is a criticism of Mozart's Don Giovanni, which seeks to exhibit this opera as a classical expression for sensuous geniality, an essay on the topic of ancient and modern tragedy, including a sketch of a modified Antigone, psychological studies of Marie Beaumachon, Donna Elvira, and Margaret and Gertie's Faust, an oration on The Unhappiest Man, a criticism of Scribe's comedy, The First Love, an essay entitled The Method of Rotations, describing how one may best escape being bored, and finally The Diary of the Seducer, in all respects the most amazing and brilliant production, a study of a reflective Don Juan, a highly complicated ascete who has concentrated himself upon the enjoyment of the feminine in all of its various nuances. B is a gentleman into whose house the young man, who is the author of the preceding papers, frequently comes as a welcome visitor. This gives occasion for the two long letters that make up the second volume. The subjects discussed are those which have been touched upon in conversation between them. Himself married, the ethicist writes in defense of marriage, presenting it as the deepest and most concrete manifestation of life, and hence as essentially fitted to bring out the ethical in its true significance. A second letter discusses, quote, the equilibrium between the ascetic and the ethical, 
in the development of the personality. Unquote. His ethical formula is a choice of oneself, a choice by which the absolute distinction between good and evil receives validity for the will. In choosing himself, the ethicist also becomes manifest to the world and enters into the life of the community so as to realize its social tasks. Time is interpreted as an ethical category, since it is the condition which makes a history and a development possible for the personality. The individual thus achieves an ethical continuity. The specifically ethical enthusiasm constitutes the individual's victory over ascetic secrecy, selfish, melancholy, illusory passion, and despair. Such a view of life, he asserts, does not destroy the ascetic, but preserves it and ennobles it. Quote, when I view life from the ethical point of view, I see it in its beauty. Life becomes rich in beauty and not poor, as it really is for you. I do not have to travel around the globe to find traces of beauty here and there, nor to rove about the streets. I do not have to choose and select to criticize and reject. To be sure, I am not blessed with as much leisure as you are possessed of. For since I am in the habit of regarding my own life from the standpoint of its beauty, I always have enough to do. But sometimes, when I have an hour free, I take my stand at the window and observe the passers-by. And every human being that I see, I see as having beauty. Let him be ever so insignificant and humble. I can nevertheless see his beauty, for I see him as this particular individual who is at the same time the universal man. He has his concrete task in life. He does not exist for the sake of anyone else. Even though he be the humblest of wage servants, his teleology is self-contained. He realizes his task. He conquers and I can see his victory. For a brave man does not see spooks. A brave man sees everywhere victorious heroes. It is only the coward who can see no heroes, but only spooks. End of quote. At the close of the work is a sermon, the fruit of the meditation of a country parson, a friend of bees. It gives expression to that religious enthusiasm which overcomes the incommensurability existing between the infinite and the finite, removing the obstacles caused by the misunderstanding between God and man, by resolutely braving this misunderstanding out. Its theme is, quote, the happiness to be derived from the thought that, as over against God, you are always in the wrong, unquote. The final word of this sermon has a peculiar significance. The sermon ends, namely, with the epigrammatic proposition that, quote, only the truth which edifies is truth for you, unquote. This is a pragmatic principle on a higher level and serves as a concrete expression for Kierkegaard's ethical individualism. The appeal to edification is not, as might perhaps be imagined, a refuge for vagueness of thought, since Kierkegaard gives the concept of edification itself an elaboration precise and definite. The ethic thus presented in the second part of Either Or is an ideal ethic. It ignores the possibility of a radical evil. It assumes that the individual may find himself, even in his despair, without breach of continuity with his former self, and without the necessity of a new point of departure. Now this is a view of the matter that Kierkegaard did not at the time hold. But he tells us that he wished to develop the implications of an ideal ethic before taking up the problem of evil. When a man has reached a point in his experience where the ethical ideal exists for him in all its infinitude, then, and not before, will he be prepared to have his attention called to the fact of the evil will. Here the strictly religious crisis begin, for here the individual needs divine assistance. An imminent ethical doctrine of life necessarily assumes that man finds his individual duty 
and destiny commensurate with the life of the community. The ethical and the universal are for such a view coincident. In the realization of his ethical task, the individual is consequently manifest to all and intelligible to his social environment. The individual neither needs nor experiences any private relationship with the divine, a relation distinguishable, that is to say, from the relationship which he sustains to the community. The community is for him essentially identical with the divine. God is like the horizon of the landscape, or like the point outside the picture, which determines its perspective. But God does not enter immediately into life as an individual factor. When the fact of sin is acknowledged, however, the whole situation is changed. An individual relationship to God becomes a life necessity, and it is only by a transcendence of the old immediacy and of the social relationships grounded therein that the ideal self can be found in its reality. Such a personal relationship between God and the individual is by Kierkegaard identified with the Christian concept of faith. The clarification of this concept thus becomes the next problem in his literary program. By means of three successive volumes he advances, step by step, to a psychological motivation for faith. Fear and Trembling, a Dialectical Lyric by Johannes de Salentio, 1843. The Repetition, a Psychological Experiment by Constantine Constantius, 1843. And Anxiety, a Simple Descriptive Psychological Inquiry with a View to the Elucidation of the Dogmatic Problem of Original Sin by Vigilius Hofnensis, 1844. The last named was published on the same day as the Philosophical Chips and constitutes from the point of view of content a companion volume. End of recording. Either or by David F. Swenson. Pages 16 to 21.